Welcome to the fifth week's study of advanced data analytics. In this week, we will consider a class of algorithms that are dedicated to represent data, so that the transformed data representation would make subsequent analytic tasks easier to perform. I follow some of the comments in the early student feedback. So in this first part of the video, I will briefly glance all the main points we will study this week, and give a simple example so that to allow you to follow the discussion we will make in class, or at least understand the rough idea behind it, and I will give the details in subsequent videos. If you remember what you have read from the subject outline, you may find that、um, the fifth part of the main course in this subject、uh, was called dimension reduction and feature selection.、Uh, but introducing in this week, I would like to take a, a slightly more modern approach, calling it data representation. Although The data representation. By data representation, I mean we represent data in a more simplified form. Either way, yeah, when applying such algorithm, we try to invent some informative attributes. Those attributes are synthetic; they are not directly observable. But by inventing them smartly. We can use them to represent those raw observations more concisely, and render of analytics easier and more stable.、Uh, but why a succinct representation can render the analytics easier and stable? Let's、uh, keep this question in mind, and for now. Consider a very important attributes of、uh, characteristics of this family of algorithms. Different from all the algorithms we have、um, uh, discussed so far, which are for predictive tasks, the data representation algorithm algorithms we discussed in this week may or may not refer to the target value of the data. That means, in many scenarios, it suffices to have the part of the data that remains observable in both the training and the test stage. And for this part of data, it is suffices to、um, construct a transformation, so the data representation is more informative. informative. This operation sounds like free lunch, isn't it? Because we do not have any target value observed, and somehow we can invent some operation so that after doing those kind of operation,、um, the the observations becomes more forthcoming when it comes to using them to predict the, the target values. This brings us back to the previous question. From the perspective of information theory, if you consider it carefully, the possibility that we can construct those algorithms and let them work is mysterious at two levels. At the first level, we can consider if you represent data in different、uh, forms. And those forms are convertible from each other. Those different representation of data must con contain the same amount of information. So it is interesting why some of the representation is more facilitate the predictive task more than the others. And at the second level, even if some of the representation Is、uh, easier for the prediction than the others. 
why isn't it a uh, more complicated representation that are the better ones? Because consider that when constructing those uh, uh, more succinct or concise representations, probably one need to discard information to make the representation shorter than the raw observations. So why by discarding information that make, makes the prediction task easier instead of more difficult? The motivation behind the simplified representation is that, of course, more complicated and more informative, uh, more information convening representations give you more potential to construct uh, good uh, predictors. However, in practice, your capability of realizing all the good potentials are limited by the fact that you have only limited observation of data samples. Let's consider an example. Say you are a very busy banker and want to deal with a lot of loan applications and you have only time to investigate your customers about their annual income and uh, their current debt. See, in this chart, we plot two kinds of historical customers. For one kind of customer, mm, it, they prove them they are good customers, they uh, repay money on time, and the others, they eventually went in uh, default. So the task is to given this historical customer behavior data to make a, a like a loan approval rule to distinguish different uh, customers in future. A reasonable policy is of course shown by this plot. Uh, we derive some kind of debt to income ratio. If you are below the ratio the, some threshold of the ratio, um, we can think probably you are good and uh, yeah, this customer will have higher probability to pay their loan on time in future and uh, otherwise those are high risk customers. And uh, um, it is reasonable and uh, uh, inconsistent with everyday experience. So far, so good, but however, the problem is a machine generally does not have everyday common sense. So given the limited historical observations, it is totally legitimate for a data model to return you such a distinction rule of the customers. That rule looks quite ridiculous if you uh, considering it in a, in a human's eye, like it, uh, well, it totally gets con uh, situations wrong that uh, uh, according to that rule, when your income is uh, higher than some threshold and uh, uh, when your debt is lower, you are at high risk. Otherwise, you are good customers. That is totally wrong. But the data model has the freedom of use both the income and the debt to derive some approval rule. And uh, according to its observations, its current rule distinguishes distinguish the customers quite successfully. So there is nothing can be improved or helped Everything goes according to the book. Maybe you have noticed that the problem is that the data model has too much freedom to derive any approval rule according to these two attributes. And that freedom mismatches the amount of available data. So, um, what's the problem? 
One way to deal with that is to remove some of the freedom the algorithm have. Um, in the simplest way, we can just use one instead of two attributes. For developing the approval of, uh, policy, for example, if we consider only the debt, although we have two attributes per customer, but on the dimension of the debt, <coughs> we can consider all customers uh, to be represented as by only one number. And using that one number, uh, we can easily cut a threshold. If we project this threshold back to the original customer space, we find we get uh, a line that split the two-dimensional uh, plane in a way that although it is uh, not as good as if we can use both two attributes, but given the limited data, it is more reasonable than some of the worst scenario two-dimensional policies we could uh, the, the algorithm might uh, result in. Similarly, we can use the dimension of income to distinguish customers. And interestingly, in this case, notice that there will be some errors in the training data. But even when we incur some training errors, we know that um, um, the unknown data distribution that, um, well, we know from everyday experience. This kind of uh, classification rule will work better than the field case as we discussed above. The methodologies to perform such simplification of the data are generally called feature selection. The term feature for now you can understand it has the same meaning as attributes of data. It is slightly more general. Later we will find that um, by attributes, generally you will refer to something that you can observe directly. But a feature can not only be observed, but can also be constructed. So the technology of feature selection we will discuss here actually means to select a subset of attributes to represent data in a more simplified form. I won't go to the details of all those uh, uh, family of algorithms because one kind of uh, methodology is called filter. That means um, we do the selection before we have some independent evaluation process using which we select a good subset of attributes for the main data mining or learning algorithm. Uh, second strategy is the wrapper. Here we do not need uh, an indep independent evaluation procedure. We can just go into a for loop and in each round of the loop we do the learning and evaluate its performance. Uh, at last we get the best subset of features. And uh, the third, well the third family uh, we have already encountered, uh, that is the selection procedure has been embedded in the learning algorithm uh, for example, the decision trees. Look in decision trees in each of the decision step, we uh, the the predictor will be concentrating on one particular attribute of the data. So by constructing the decision tree, we automatically use or select a subset of the attributes. Hopefully, if the decision tree is not too deep, uh, to perform to do the predictive tasks. So that is called embed. But to be honest, I find the discussion we had just made is rather taxonomological. Those are just the terms that telling you that uh, uh, we can perform uh, the uh, selection this way. And uh, actually, there won't be too practical to follow the first two procedures. Uh, why? Let's consider. For example, um, in bioinformatics, some 
DNA sequences that can have tens of thousands of tributes. If we look, if we consider only two attribute subset from some tens of thousands candidates, then we will be looking at something like hundreds of millions of combinations. And that is, we limit our choice of only two attributes. How about three? How about four? And for a raw observation of tens of thousands of attributes, probably some subset of two, three, four won't be too much representative. So in practice, one is often looking at subsets of some of uh, with some significance of a uh, proportion proportion of the original data set, such as um, one thousand or two thousand. In the case when you have tens of thousand attributes in the raw observations, the number of combination will increase explosively in this case. So by no way one can possibly try uh, all the combinations of the features. So in practice, probably only the third that is the embedded and the selection by learning scheme will actually work. What matters is uh, you know how to choose those attributes in the learning. So it is the learning algorithm that really counts. As we have mentioned earlier, a very important family of algorithms of simplifying data is to instead of using existing raw observ observed attributes, they construct actively construct new attributes, we call them features, to uh, represent the data. Uh, such algorithms are um, generally they will be based on assumption that although there are many raw observations and uh, the data could vary or change in many many ways in the high dimensional data space, but in practice there are some underlying generating factors that is behind the data. Uh, such as if you consider there are maybe <coughs> millions of pixels of an image of human face, but there are only limited ways of uh, human face can change from like expressions, age, gender, uh, hairstyle, um, well, factors like that. But if you listed all those possible uh, variations, the number would be probably much less than something like a million. So how to um, export uh, such assumption and build um, effective uh, data models that can summarize information from these raw observations? In the following, we will consider a particularly useful and practical algorithm that is called principal component analysis. PCA goes a further step in the assumption of low dimensional data subspace. They consider the data is in linear subspace. Those underlying factors, they generate data using only linear relationships, such as shown in this plot. Of course, the contrast of the numbers, the factors, and the raw observations is not dramatic here. Um, there we use two factors to generate three attributes. Each uh, look by assumption, each raw observation, each raw observed attribute is a linear combination of two factors. And the powerful derivation is that if the generation uh, relationship is linear, then there is also a linear transform that allow us to reverse the generation process and reveal the hidden factors from the data. But when you are going to realize such a scheme in practice, of course, the problem is we do not have the hypothetical transformation from generation process from the factors 
to those observations. So how can we construct the inverse transform from the raw observations to the factors? In principal component analysis, this inverse transform is constructed by uh, optimizing the variation those hidden factors could possibly explain from data, the data. By variation, we mean within the observed data set, which hopefully from the unknown data distribution in the raw observation data space of high dimensional, how one data sample changes or, or be differ from another data sample. We will discuss some mathematical details later in this video lecture, but in this part, let us first see an example of uh, what um, realize the assumption of PCA. An example of how to perform PCA on our old friend, the Iris dataset. Oh, by the way, if you find it is uh, familiar to see the diagram of PCA, because it is. Uh, this is the diagram of uh, the neural network we have learned in week two. Computationally, the structure of the model such as neural network and the PCA could be very similar to each other, but there are two essential differences. One is that a neural network is a supervised data model. To train or to construct a neural network, you would need uh, both the observable part of the data, those attributes that you can observe both in the training and the test stage, and also the target set, the target value that you will, well, as the desired output of the model in the test stage. But PCA does not care about um, the test values. PCA can work only on those X part of the data. And the second difference is that in new network, you will give a nonlinear transformation at each layer of the computation, but PCA is entirely a linear model. I have to say there is extensions of PCA and myself do academic works on the extensions of PCA, but if we consider the classical PCA model, they are linear. Say an example of um, realizing the assumption of a PCA using three dimensional data with two dimensional hidden factors. The, uh, to prepare the, the, the demonstration, you will need this uh, uh, little bit more package because we would like to realize data in three dimensions. So let us construct the two hidden factors. One, we let it to vary from 0 to 1 with a step of 0 0.05. Mm. And uh, the second factor, we, we, we let it vary from 0 to 0 0.5 with a step size of 0 0.05 as well. To construct the observable attributes, let's consider there are three observable attributes. The first one, we call it x, and uh, the connection between the factor, hidden factor a to x, we let it to be 0 0.3. And uh, the connection between the hidden factor b and uh, x, we let it to be 0 0.5. So when we construct the observable data, the x coordinate of the data point will be the factor between the link between the factor a and x that is 0 0.3 multiplies the factor a. Of course we let factor a to loop from e uh, each read uh, from all possible factor a values. And uh, the second part the second part of the contribution to attribute x from factor b with a width of xb that is 0 0.5. Similarly, we construct 
the attribute y and attribute z. Those three parts are attributes that can be observed from the data, and we let the factors a and b to be hidden. So after constructing those three coordinate or attributes of the data, we append uh, one data sample to the data set. Here uh, we convert the uh, body of the data into a NAPI array. And uh, this statement is new to us. That is to construct a three-dimensional visualization of the data. You can play with that yourself. And uh, using this axis, the axis you can, uh, we can understand as the uh, canvas on which we can draw objects. This canvas provides us a functionality of scatter three dimension. So we can put three dimensional scatters um, on the canvas uh, for which we provide the first uh, coordinate of the data or the attribute, the second as y and the third as z. Uh, Z. Uh, so this edge color thing is just to make the plot more visible. Uh, note one thing is in this example, we will use um, this form of uh, the data visualization package instead of uh, the familiar one that PYLab inline. We do not use the inline plotting because we want to have a look at the data and uh, play with it, with it. Anyway, let us try. Uh, remember this statement, plt dot show. That is to bring the plotting uh, onto the screen, which generally does not. We do not need if we use the inline plotting, but for this example, we will need it. If we run this cell. Well, a figure will appear. On my computer, the, um, the window does not automatically jump in, in front, so you may want to explore a little bit where, where it is. It is here. Let me bring it here. So, lab. so that is a three-dimensional data distribution. We can, you can click on the uh, display and uh, drag your mouse to have the exploration of the, 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 the data. Note that this example does not show PCA. This example shows the assumption of PCA. The PCA actually needs to recover the hidden factors from such data if, as if the data were generated in this way. At least in practice, some data may contain the variances that cannot be explained by the hidden units. For example, if we give a small variance of the data, such as um, some normal distributed noises. So let's disturb each of the component, each of the attribute of the observable data in this way and see what we will have. The new version of the data is shown by this plot. If we look at carefully a little bit, um, the each of uh, the data sample uh, change its position uh, slightly from its original position and that is the effect of the noise. Hopefully in practice uh, PCE assumes that the data contains some noises in their observations and the noises distributed fully in the high dimensional data uh, space but the noises would be small. The variance uh, contributed by the noises would be small compared to the difference from one data sample to another data symbol contributed by the hidden factors. Construct the inverse linear transformation and reveal the hidden factors. Uh, 
Let us see an example of performing PCA on the Iris dataset using the sixth learn package. As usual, let's start initializing the realization environment and uh, import all the packages. Uh, but look, I re import the NAPI, but it does not matter to repeatedly import some packages. And we got the load Iris function which allows you to take the iris data from, from uh, the, the, the pre-processed secret learn uh, package. And uh, the PCA module is provided by a sub-module called decomposition from secret learn. Later we will find this sub-module provides us not only PCA but a family of algorithms. We call them component analysis to um, transform the data and get a simplified and more useful representation. So run this, uh, this cell to get the PCA ready. Uh, the usage is as usual. We load the data using load iris, create a PCA um, object, and use this PCA object to fit to the data's well data part that is the x part the four attributes of the iris data and transform the iris data itself the, the result will be given to a variable called transform the data so if you run this part pca has been done Let us explore from a few expects what PCA provide uh, what PCA has to provide us. Um, check the transformed data first. So at least have a look at this sheep. Well, 140 samples and each sample has well four attributes. You may want to ask. Where is the promise of simplify the representation of the data? Given four attributes, resulting in four attributes, where is the simplification? Let us say first why PCA returns us the exact number of attributes as the input, the input data, and then have a look uh, where is the difference between the return transformed data and the original data and how we can interpret it as simplification. The PCA module accept a parameter allows you to specify how many component you want to calculate. The concept of component yes the namesake of PCA the C Corresponding is corresponding to the hidden factor we discussed so far. In the transformed data, each transformed attribute or coordinate feature is corresponding to one individual component and represents how much the contribution of this component to this particular data sample. So by assigning the number of component a PCA will calculate or construct, we determine the number of uh, attributes or features of the resulting as the resulted transform the data. Leaving this parameter to blank to the PCA module, the object will try to construct as many components as possible from the data. Generally, that means the number of the original attributes. Although in the transformed data, the contribution to the, each of the individual data samples from those components will decrease from the first component to the last one. So we see it is the, the first component is the most important ones and the last ones are the least important ones. To simplify the representation, one can simply keep only those contributions from the first few components and discard, discarding 
the contributions from the last few components. Let us formally investigate the meaning of this statement. Let us check the variance of those returned attributes. We use the function nappy dot standard variance and uh, calculate the variance of the transformed data. Let the parameter axis to be zero means we want to calculate the variance uh, with respect to each of the returned features or attributes among the 150 samples. We can see that the contribution to each of the sample varies significantly from the first attribute, a uh, first return feature to the last one. So PCA successfully explored uh, returned as some components um, for which the importance in contributing the variance in the data decreases. And uh, if we explore the importance um, in the variance of the original attributes. There is no such distinction between them. Some, of course, uh, is more important than the others, but uh, generally that does not contain too much information for analytics. So far we have discussed the PCA algorithm, uh, which is enough for us to study in class. Later in this video lecture, I will discuss some more properties of PCA, such as um, um, capability of preserving distances between data samples, and it can be used to reconstruct samples or important information, and some interesting extensions to component analysis, as well as several aspects in modern data representation.